This is the Davidson County Network. Hi, welcome to the Davidson County Network. Today, as part of our conversation series, we're speaking with Miss Nora Hall. Nora is a guardian ad litem and child advocate here in Davidson County. Nora has also helped to pass two laws giving rights to victims of abuse. Today, she is going to talk to us about her journey that brought her here. Uh, prior to moving here, I lived in Greensboro. And I was a homeschool mom. I had five kids. I um, had been stayed at home with them for almost 15 years at that point. Uh, my oldest child was almost 15, and or she was 15, I'm sorry. And my youngest two children were four. I had four-year-old twins. Um, on February 21st, 2009, at 3.42 in the afternoon, um, I was made aware that my husband was molesting my child. Immediately, everything in my world changed. I um, didn't know how we would survive a week, much less be here 10 years later. As you can imagine, having been at home, not being a breadwinner in the family, immediately, my thoughts were about my child and my, my other children as well and how to how to keep them safe and how to fix this damage that was being done to, that had been done to them and I also had to suddenly worry about well, how are we gonna survive how are we gonna live where were we gonna where are we gonna go um, I could we would lose the house there was no there was no doubt we'd lose the house but on top of that, the damage that had been done to my children um, was almost more than I could handle. Um, so I can't I can't tell my story without talking about um, just just the crazy grace that's involved. Even though I'm talking about a heinous crime against a child from day one or before day one. Um, there was just, there was grace. There was so much grace involved in our world. The day after I found out, well, the day I found out, he was um, taken from the home and told he couldn't come back. The, he was not arrested for 21 more days. So from that point on, he, he never came back to our home. Um, but I didn't know how we were gonna survive. And the next morning, I got a call from a lady that I go to church with, and, and this was before anyone even knew what had happened. Um, this was less than 24 hours later. First thing that morning, it was a Saturday morning, Sunday morning, I got a call from her, and she said, I don't know um, if you need this, but I have a home in Davidson County that you can live in, that you and the children can stay. Um, immediately, one of those burdens was taken off my plate. You know, all the all the things that were on my shoulders, just in an instant of finding out what had been happening, um, immediately that burden was lifted. And since that time, every burden has been lifted. It's not always easy. It's not even pretty a lot of the times, but I always know that, that we're going to be taken care of. I always know um, that there's a crazy amount of grace that we're going to be given. So um, in April of 2009, we moved to um, Davidson County. The trial was in Guilford County um, because the crimes had happened in Greensboro. What I learned from just having to experience this was that I had lived in a bubble <laughs> prior to February 21st. I, um, I had no clue how the system worked. You know, I was 37 years old. 
and I thought right was right and wrong was wrong and I thought you know you call the police and they arrest someone and then that person just goes to prison and it's over um, as silly as that sounds I think that's really how most of us feel we know there's a process but we don't really understand how that process really does work um, as I said before it took 21 days for him to be arrested um, they didn't just come in and pull him out they had to gather evidence um, which they did you know they, they found DNA and video and <clears throat> text messages and and so after 21 days he was finally arrested um, and then that the new part of the journey began um, once he was arrested Greensboro I want to say they immediately filed eight charges um, I could be wrong about that I, I think it was a total of 14 when all was said and done but they statutory rape um, sex offense and a parental role um, indecent liberties and then within a week I say High Point also filed um, charges I think they filed six more of the same type of charges um, so I expected they had this evidence he was going to go to trial um, and that it would happen I didn't think it would happen overnight um, but I didn't expect to be there two years later still waiting on this to happen and there were so many times so many court dates that I, I didn't understand I'd, I'd never been a part of the system so many court dates one after the other and we had a victim's witness coordinator and she said you don't need to come to these court dates but how could I not come to these court dates my mom heart wouldn't let me what if something happened what if I missed something what if they let him go I was assured over and over that wouldn't happen but I could not go and at this point we're living at um, in Southmont so we're off the beaten path and um, it, it, it's a trip it's a trip and you know we're barely surviving so that trip to Greensboro to sometimes three times a month and having to get my kids somewhere that they would be safe um, it was it was it was quite a burden and for two years we had these kind of hearings and then after that um, they had they had a plea hearing and settled the case and he went to prison but the battle didn't stop there it seems like every day in 10 years there's always a new battle there's always something else I have to fight to keep my kids safe um, whether it is the pedophile once he was released or um, just the system what I found was there is no protection for these victims there's no they have no rights they have no say um, and this became very concerning for me because these were my children that had no rights and had no say so we kept hitting walls I kept having to tell my kids over and over that their government wouldn't protect them you know I've always been very patriotic I've, I've taught them to be patriotic they love this country this is the greatest country in the world and I have to keep telling these little children over and over that they had no rights that they couldn't be protected that it was not um, a given that they would be safe 
And in my prior life, I had no clue. I had no clue that children were just kind of swept under the rug the way they are. They, they're, um, they're not treated like people. Um, so the first bill we passed, my youngest two children had um, the pedophiles last night. And obviously when we were free from this, that is not something we want to carry around. Um, it's not something they should have to carry around. And so I had gone to try to change their names and the only way I could legally change their names was to get the pedophile's permission to do so. Um, and that, that made no sense. We're not gonna ask him for anything. So I started talking to people. Um, you know, the clerk of court, um, a house representative, just different people, what can we do? I kept looking at the laws and trying to find a loophole that my kids could fit through. Um, but there wasn't one. And I spent four years trying to find that loophole. And there, there wasn't one. And names are important. Identities are important. Legally, they could use an alias. Except for in medical circumstances, in doctor's offices, and in school. Well, they're homeschooled, so that wasn't an issue, but my kids have special needs. Um, my, at the time, four-year-old. Um, is autistic. He has um, other issues, so he was he was seeing lots of doctors, and every time we'd go, they would call him the wrong name. And every time we go, he would get very, very upset because that wasn't his name. Um, legally, it was his name, but it was not the name he went by, and we couldn't fix that. I went to um, house representatives, and, and I said, can you help me with this? You know, something has to be done. And, and I kept getting, no, no, you can't fix it. This is, it is what it is. This is how it is. Um, and so in February of 2013, I was fed up. And I went, drove to Denton and walked into Stan Bingham's office. And I said, this is my problem. And I explained to him that my children shouldn't have to ask a rapist, a child rapist, permission for anything and um, he said that makes no sense we need to fix this um, so I believe it was within a week he had a bill on the floor to change the name change requirements for children um, if you're ever on my page and you see 369 that was the Senate bill number um, that it was filed under and by May the governor had signed the, um, the name change requirement for minors law um, into law. So um, it not only allowed these children a voice um, to be who they wanted to be, it also was able to change the chain of command that these children's name changes go through. So they'll be less easy to track. So if they're running from um, their abuser, if they're trying to stay hidden from their abuser, um, which most are, um, it makes them a little bit more difficult to track. So on October 1st of 2013, my children got their name, and they have been officially Halls ever since, but they were Halls since 2009. Um, the other bill was in 2015, when the pedophile was released from prison, um, my daughter that he had molested had no protection against him. And so the only way to get protection was to file for a 50B. Um, 
which is a domestic violence protective order. Unless you've filed for a 50B, you may not know, but generally attorneys are not involved in the 50B process. Generally, the plaintiff and defendant are both pro se, they're their own attorneys. And so in order for her to file for the 50B, she would have to get on the stand and give testimony as to why she needed it. Well, in, in our justice system, you can't speak out or give testimony without the the defendant having a right to question you. So working at, as his own attorney, that means that she's going to sit on the stand and have this offender who did horrific things to her question her. And not only that, but this 50B, if granted, would only be good for one year. And then she'd have to do this whole thing over again. So, once again, I drove to Senator Bingham's office. Um, and I, I don't know, what, what can we do? How can we fix this? We, we need, sex offense victims need to have the right to have permanent protection against their offenders. Um, and so in spring, I believe, of 2015, he ran the a bill which allowed for a permanent protective order for sex offense victims. And I believe sometime in the summer, June, it was signed into law, and on October 1st, it became law in North Carolina, 2015. Um, my kid is strong, <laughs> she, but she shouldn't have to handle that. She, she, they've been through enough, and all of these victims have been through enough. And, and once somebody has been convicted of a sex offense against you, it makes no sense that they should have any access to you ever whatsoever. Um, and so now it's possible to be able to get this, it is a 50D. Um, in doing all this, somewhere along the line, um, as I'm fighting all these battles back in, I believe this was in 2012, um, I realized that these kids have no have no rights. They have they have no one speaking for them. They have no one fighting for them. The system is going to do what the system is going to do. The district attorneys are going to make plea deals just to not have to do a trial. Um, it's it's not about the children. It's not even about the victim. Um, it becomes only about the offender. So, in 2012, I knew that all these things that had happened, that everything that we'd been through needed to be used for good. Um, something good had to come out of this process. Something good um, needed to happen. And so that's when I... Um, decided to apply to become a guardian ad litem. If nothing else, my goal originally was to be able to like at least help people understand this system a little better um, and to understand like what each of these hearings is, how, how they work. And, and I wanted to be a blessing to, to these children. Um, instead, every one of these kids has blessed me over and over and over again. I've gotten way more blessing out of being able to advocate for them and be able to speak for them than I've ever given. So you've talked to us a little about your battles in criminal court. Can you tell us about your battles in civil court? Yes, I think those are what if 
a lot of people in Davis County might actually know me for because um, I've been pretty outspoken about having to have fought so hard um, to keep my kids safe from the pedophile once he was released from custody. When he was released, I had a 50B, which is the domestic violence order, um, and it covered myself and my children. And um, I was still living, you know, completely in poverty in someone else's home, doing everything I could to survive and keep our lights on and keep my kids fed. So hiring an attorney at that point was not even something I could think of doing. But I didn't need to worry about it because my children were specifically covered on my 50B. It wasn't, I wasn't given custody on my 50B. They were covered, um, all the minor children in the household he had to stay away from, um, which has gotten kind of messed up in the last couple years um, and skewed into how that's told. Um, but I went into court to renew my 50B, which you have to do every year. And um, the judge refused to renew it as written. Um, she removed the children from the 50B, their protection, and, but left me covered. So, and while we were standing in court that day, the pedophile threatened me that if he didn't get to see his kids in 30 days that he was going to go into file for custody. Um, so at this point I had no choice so I started visiting attorneys. I would visited attorneys prior um, but none of them felt like I could win. Not that I couldn't win custody but that I couldn't keep my children completely protected from this monster. Um, they felt like the judges would want to protect his rights as, as a parent um, more than they'd want to protect my children. So I walked into on a referral into Roy McDonald's office one day and I told him my story and I said I need an attorney and he didn't promise me we could win he didn't promise me that my kids would be safe um, but he did say we can try we can do everything we can we can um, work to put up as many parameters um, to keep him from having access to your kids but we can try so um, I went into court July it was July um, 24th and 25th of 2012 um, I know this because my child, my oldest child was in court with me and it was her birthday the first day. Um, I went into court not believing I could win. I went into court knowing that this could be the end of my kid's safety. Um, people would say, well, he would only get supervised visitation. I'm not sure how much experience you've had with pedophiles and sociopaths and those type, those type people, but supervised visitation is not safe. You know, he manipulates young children. <laughs> you know pedophiles take years that they're not they're not impatient they take years as they manipulate their children and most of the time the other adults around don't see it until it's too late so the fact that it would be supervised visitation did not make my children safe it also didn't protect their hearts and it didn't give them a say and 
the whole time I, I'm having this conversation with my children and we're back to, I can't promise you that you won't have to be around him. And they didn't understand why, why would a judge do that? Why, why would our courts make us see the inmate? And I didn't have an answer. It was from the time I had to file until we went to court, I didn't have an answer. Um, what a horrific place to be put in as a parent to tell your kids, you know, we live in the best country, we have the best judicial system in the world, but it's not gonna protect you. Um, I went in feeling like there was no way my kids were gonna be safe coming out of there. And um, you know, we had, I had taken all the evidence from his criminal trial um, and had given it to Mr. McDonald. He had submitted all of it into evidence and um, the pedophile's um, attorney didn't argue to not have it put in. So all of that got put into um, this case. There were over 200 pages. So um, it, was, it was a lot of reading material for the judge. And after a, de a full day of testimony, um, I testified, a uh, friend of mine testified, um, the children's therapist testified, and the pedophile testified. Um, he didn't bring anybody with him. He didn't have any of his family members there. Um, so we, all, we testified, we had this hearing, I'm sorry, for the entire day, and um, the next day we came back for closing and um, and for her ruling. So I'll never forget, like in her closing, his attorney said, well, you know, we know that their therapist said this would not be good for them. This would impede their progress. This would get in the way of working through these special needs that these kids have. We know that the therapist said this, um, but we don't know that that's for sure. So we could always just try to let him have some visitation. And if it doesn't work out, she can bring it back to court. All I heard was, well, why don't you let your kids go out and play in the street and maybe they won't get run over. But if they do, well, then maybe we can just not let them go the next time. I, I don't know. Um, I was appalled. Uh, so, um, when Judge Covington went away, um, I guess to put her thoughts together. She came back and um, I, this was the most horrifying two and a half minutes of my life. I had no idea, no idea what was going to happen. Um, I, I wasn't positive about it. Um, I just had no idea. And she came out and she started saying um, positive things. And she, she quoted from some of um, the evidence, a, a letter my daughter had written and in the very beginning. And that said to me, she had to have read, she had gone through all 200 pages of this evidence. I never expected that. And she got up there and she quoted and she, went through her her findings and she said you know that I was I was a good mother and I was fit and proper um, and at that point after sitting through a trial all day and then having the pedophile um, he, had, he had been on the stand and called me abusive um, 
I needed to hear that. Um, so that, that was relief. But I did, still didn't know if my children were safe. Um, so even through, you know, the first, I don't know, the first three-fourths of, of her giving her ruling, I am still completely, completely petrified. And, um, and then she says that the pedophile is not proper and it would not be good for the children to have to be around him. Um, life changing moment right there. Um, and at that moment, She joined Roy McDonald as my two heroes. I, I will never ever be able to repay Mr. McDonald for being willing to stand up and give my kids a voice and fight for them. Um, Judge Covington just did her job, but she did it well. You know, she didn't do that for me. She didn't, I guess at the end of the day, she did it for my children, but it, Roy's goal had been to protect my kids and to make them safe. You know, Mary's goal was to do her job and do it well. Um, and she was, she was fantastic. And since becoming a GAL, I found that she's always fantastic. She is um, one of the we, we have some really good judges here, um, some fantastic judges who watch out for our kids and put our kids first, um, and that's good to know. We also have judges that will remove children from a protective order, um, so So you told us earlier about uh, Mr. Stan Bingham. Can you tell us a little bit more? Like how big of a role did he play in all of this? Stan. He, he, he is on that list of heroes with Roy and Judge Covington. He, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know Stan prior to coming to Davidson County. I honestly didn't know him prior to really walking into his office. I, um, I, I knew other representatives and other people who served us, but I didn't know Stan really. Um, so I went to the other people that I knew and they all, it was a wall, a wall everywhere. And, um, you know, some tried, they did what they could, you know, our clerk of court tried everything he could to help me, but short of breaking the law, he couldn't do anything. Um, so I was working at the GOP headquarters and I noticed that people kept coming in and they would, it didn't matter who they were, they talked about how Stan helped them, Stan helped me, Stan helped me. Um, I'm a Democrat and Stan helped me, I, I, they come to get signs. Um, and what I realized in that time was that it was about its constituents. It, it wasn't about, are you a Republican or you're a Democrat, it's my, my constituents and if they need something and I can help them, I will. Um, I realized that that too, um, Stan was. He was a servant. And um, the election ended in November. I put, wasn't really thinking about Stan. And over Christmas that year, I tried one more time to just like find a loophole in the law. There has to be a way that um, my kids could have their identity that they have a say in their lives. Um, but there wasn't one, and I'll, I'll never forget, everything was in January, late January. Um, I was in Brian Shipwash's office, and he's like, and I'm like, what can I do? How can I fix this? What, how can we work this so that my children can have their name? And he's like, change the law. Oh, it never occurred to me that that was what I needed to do. Um, and so I spent about a week thinking about that and I realized that the person I needed to talk to was this person who I kept hearing about the whole time I was working at headquarters. 
Um, I didn't know him. I previously had not been a supporter because I didn't know him. And I drove to his office. I made an appointment. I called him and made an appointment. And I went to his office, and I was a nervous wreck. I'm always a nervous wreck because there's always everything's on the line. Um, I drove to his office, and I went in, and I explained everything that happened and what we needed. And then I told him the only way to make this happen is for us to ask the abuser. And he, that makes no sense. I'd waited four years at this point for somebody to tell me that that made no sense. Of course it makes no sense. And he, he's like, well, we're gonna have to do something about that. And immediately he did it, he got it done. Um, immediately, within, within a week or two. And within three months, it was signed. Um, and then when a couple years later in 2015, when we ran into the whole 50B issue, I didn't hesitate to go and say, what can we do? Um, this one's a little trickier, um, but it wasn't as cut and dry. How are we gonna handle this? What, what kind of um, legislation do we need? But he got on it, he got his attorneys on it, he got you know um, his Raleigh people on it. Um, they called me probably the next week asking, my, asking me questions, trying to put it together. How are we, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna word this? And um, that one took a little bit longer to get signed. It was June, not May, before it got signed. And I was a little nervous it wasn't gonna get signed, um, even though Senator Mingle kept telling me it was fine. Um, but they had some financial issues with budgeting that they kept putting things back, and I was worried it wasn't gonna make it. But it did, it got signed in June. He is, he, it, neither one of those laws would have happened without him. Well, Nora, thank you so much for telling us your story and being so open and honest about everything. I guess my final question is, what advice would you give a mother or anybody that could be going through the same situation that you dealt with? Um, we call moms who know and do nothing MIA moms at my house, and, and there, are, there are many of them. So, so many, I've, I've, you know, once you're in a situation, it's amazing like how many people you find out um, can relate to that situation and, and how many adults come to me whose parents never helped them, who never protected them. Um, so we started calling these MIA moms. There have been times, I, all right, I would be lying if I didn't say on some weird level, I understand an MIA mom. Um, on February 21st, 2009, at 342, I knew that I had no idea how I was going to take care of these kids and raise these kids. I had no idea how we were going to, where were we going to live? Where were we going to eat? It's horrific. I would never have done it any differently. It was never an option for me to do it differently. Um, but on some level, I understand the horror of having to make that decision. But at the end of the day, it's not a decision. At the end of the day, your children matter. At the end of the day, everything else will work out. Food is not even that important. There are places where you can get food. Power is not that important. We have learned. Water is not that important. Um, food, clothing, and shelter, they seem to be um, relatively important, but they are not more important than your child's life. Um, there are resources. There are so many resources that are willing to help you. Um, and it's so easy to get lost in that system. Just always keep fighting. As many walls as you hit, keep fighting. And you're gonna hit another wall and fight that battle. And you're gonna hit another wall and you're gonna have to fight that battle. And the rest of your life might be all about fighting battles. Um, 
but your kids aren't going to have to fight those battles. Your kids are going to be safe. Your kids are going to have a future. I mean, that's what it's all about for me. What kind of future are my kids going to have? I'm almost 50 years old. It's, it's not about what kind of future I'm going to have. I, I, I walked away from that when I, I had children. You know, if something were to happen to those children, then I have to choose them over me. And they have the rest of their lives. And they're fantastic kids. Um, fantastic kids. And they're healthy. And they are um, strong, strong advocates. They know what it is to have to fight battles. Um, the day, tie it with that, the day that we went to Raleigh that the um, twins bill was voted on, the name change requirement bill, um, for the last time. We were in Raleigh for that vote. And um, it was unanimous and we left there and as we're walking back to my car, my son, who was nine at the time, yeah, he would have been nine, the, um, the youngest son, he's like, um, he got it. Because we were, you know, obviously, we were beside ourselves. We would wait to see if this would happen. This is something we've been fighting for for four for years. And um, he got it. He's like, you know, no other kids with bad guy daddies are going to have to go through this again like we did. And that's what it's about. Um, beauty from ashes, good from evil. And my kids have gotten to be a part of that. So I, I'm grateful. Well, Nora, thank you so much for fighting this fight on behalf of so many others. And just thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today.